Good afternoon. Um, we're going to get started here. My name is Deborah Gonzalez, and I'm the Government Affairs Director at the Public Policy Institute of California. For those of you who are not familiar with, the P with PPIC, it's a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank that has offices in both San Francisco and Sacramento. Today's event is part of the James Irvine Foundation Briefing Series, and we want to thank them for paying for this event, helping us put on this event, and as well as the lunch. We are going to hear about the findings from our latest PPIC statewide survey on Californians and their government. We'd like to thank again the James Irvine Foundation for their support for this survey, as well as the PPIC donor circle. You should have received a handout at registration which contains some key findings from the survey. The full survey report, as well as the slides, are now available on our website at ppic.org. You will also find crosstabs, my favorite part of our surveys, among all, likely, all adults and all likely voters. A couple more things before we begin. Later today, you will receive a short survey via email, and we ask that you please take a few moments to fill that out. Those surveys actually do tell us a lot, and we do adjust our program accordingly. Please turn off your cell phones or, or turn them down. We would appreciate that. I personally want to thank you to come, for coming out in this very rainy, or hopefully very rainy day in Sacramento. Um, as they say, all good things must come to an end. And I'm not talking about this election. We all want this election to end. I'm talking about the Saturday Night Live skits. They've been great. Um, I haven't liked an Alec Baldwin um, show since uh, Hunt for Red October. So it's kind of fun. Uh, regardless of party, I think we found them quite amusing. But on a more serious note, um, in our, our most recent poll findings, our Californians are still pretty grumpy. While Hillary Clinton holds a commanding lead in California, less than 38% of voters are happy with their choice of presidential candidates. This is down from 69% in 2012. This dissatisfaction crosses party lines with only 47% of Democrats happy, 36% of Republicans, and 22% of independents are satisfied with their choices. Only 27% of millennials are satisfied with their choices. I was at a recent event and somebody quipped, you wouldn't be happy living in your mom's basement either. So I don't know if that's true or not. My millennials, thank gosh, aren't home. California is also facing some daunting numbers of ballot initiatives. There are 17 statewide initiatives from condoms to marijuana legalization and to the death penalty. There are 228 local tax measures that are going to be voted on and 193 local bond measures. If you live in San Francisco, you have at least two dozen local initiatives, and they brought it down from about 48, I believe, but that they were considering early on. One of the things I learned from helping my daughter who's away at college is you need to put two stamps on your ballot if you're mailing it in. So just, just a word of advice. Now on for the presentation. David Cordes is a research associate at PPIC and the project manager for this survey. He has the difficult task of finding something positive and light for us in this survey. <laughs> so on this very dark and stormy day. So thank you, David. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, and thank you all for being here. Um, before we get started, there's one quick thing I wanted to share with you. So the first question in our survey, we ask, what do you think is the biggest issue facing California today? And we get people to say problems like the economy and water and the drought. And uh, it wasn't one of the top responses, but a handful of people named a different problem, which will be resolved soon, and that's the presidential election. So if you also think the presidential election is the biggest problem facing the state, rest assured, it will be over soon. Um, <laughs> so getting started, um, I just want to thank first uh, those who cooperated with me on this survey, Mark Baldessari, Dean Bonner, who's here today, and Luna Lopez. So today, um, first I'm just going to give you a little background on the PPIC survey series, some details on this specific survey, and then we'll get into some findings on the election, including the presidential race, California's US Senate race, and then we have questions on four of the 17 statewide ballot propositions. Then we have a section on state and national issues, so some approval ratings, and then interesting questions on trust in the federal government and uh, favorability toward the political parties. So the PPIC statewide survey, uh, it's an ongoing survey series going back to 1998. Uh, it's had over 150 published reports. This is the newest of them, our October survey. 
The mission of the statewide survey is to provide timely, relevant, nonpartisan data on political, social, and economic opinions to inform and improve state policymaking, raise awareness and encourage discussion, and to provide a voice for all Californians in important state policy debates. So this survey specifically, um, this is part of our Californians and their government series, which is funded by the James Irvine Foundation. Uh, we did the surveys all on telephone. Um, interviews were going up through Sunday, and I think Dean will agree this is about as quickly as we can share results with you after they come out of the field. So this is fresh numbers. Um, Half of the interviews are done on landline, half on cell phone. We ended up completing interviews with just over 1,700 adults in California. So when you see those results, keep in mind there's a 3.4% margin of error there. And then we identified just over 1,000 likely voters, and there's a 4.3% margin of error on those findings. So let's get into it. This is uh, starting with the presidential race. Here are our findings in California today with Hillary Clinton leading Donald Trump by 26 points. That's up from 16 points, uh, which is what we found in September and in July. So the movement you see here is a little bit of increase in support for Clinton, the kind of purple maroon line for Gary Johnson. He was at 10 point support and at five points today. Uh, Jill Stein is also at five points in California today. So with the large lead that Clinton has, we find that she leads across age groups, education groups, and income groups, looking across regions of the state, Hillary Clinton has a lead of about 50 points in uh, LA and in the San Francisco Bay Area. The one part of the state where Trump has a slight lead is in the Central Valley. Uh, just another interesting thing on the findings here, looking at support within the parties, uh, among Democratic registered Democrats in California, about nine in 10 say that they'll vote for Hillary Clinton. And looking back to 2012, which we'll do a bit of this today, is kind of making comparisons with the 2012 election. Back in 2012, at this point in our survey, we also found nine in 10 Democrats saying that they would support Barack Obama in his reelection. For Donald Trump, um, it's seven in 10 Republicans saying that they'll vote for him. And then again, going back to 2012, it was 86% saying they would support Mitt Romney at this point in the cycle. So a little bit of a difference there. Uh, independence today, Clinton has a two to one advantage among them. And in 2012, independents were about split at this point between Obama and Romney. We've been asking uh, voters if they're satisfied with their choices of candidates. And today we find about four in 10 saying that they are satisfied with their choices. That again is down 30 points from where we were in 2012 when seven in 10 were saying they're satisfied with their choices. Here on the chart you're seeing uh, within parties, so party registrants, how they, whether they're satisfied or not with their choices in the presidential race. And the time trend here goes back to December of last year, kind of before the primaries and caucuses started. So you can see, um, Republicans, the light blue line there, they were initially most satisfied with their choices. And if you remember, they had really a lot of choices to begin with. Um, and they've dropped by about 25 points since then, now currently 36% saying they're satisfied. Uh, Democrats have dropped slightly, that's the dark blue line. And then independents, they've dropped about 20 points and they're currently least likely to say they're satisfied with their choices, about one in five saying so today. I'm also gonna call out a few times uh, the findings for younger voters, those age 18 to 34. On this one, um, they're the least likely age group to say that they're satisfied with their choices, about one in four saying that they are. One other question on the presidential race, uh, this is just, are you more enthusiastic or less enthusiastic about voting for president than usual? And here, about half of likely voters say that they are more enthusiastic, down from about six and 10 in 2012 at this point. And you can see on the chart, 2012 in dark blue, uh, 2016 in light blue, Big differences across the parties as there were in, in 2012 also. Um, Democrats kind of about the same as they were in the last presidential cycle. You see the biggest drop is among Republicans. Um, independents are also less likely to say they're more enthusiastic today uh, and they're the least likely group to say so. So moving on to California's US Senate race, uh, which has the distinction of having two Democrats on the ballot. Uh, here are our findings today. Kamala Harris leads Loretta Sanchez 42 to 20, so that's a 22 point lead. Uh, you also see that there are 20% saying they're still undecided at this point, and another 18% telling us that they are gonna sit this race out. So these are people we've identified as likely voters. We expect them to vote in the presidential race, but when we ask them about this race, they say, I don't wanna vote for either of these candidates. Um, and since they don't have a choice with the top two primary, they're left sitting out. So uh, I'll tell you that we're at 18% saying not vote now. Uh, back in July, that was at 28%. So it's going down a little bit, and we'll see when we get to election day how many people actually do skip this race on their ballot. Um, it's interesting to note that it's just over a third of Republicans saying they're gonna skip the Senate race. 
Uh, that, though, too, is down from about half of Republicans earlier this year. So some movement there. Among the Republicans who are naming a candidate that they would support, they're split about evenly between Harris and Sanchez. Uh, Democrats, among Democrats, a majority favor Harris. And um, among independents, Harris has a two to one advantage over Sanchez. Interesting thing about Sanchez's support across the parties is that it's really about the same. It's about 20% of Democrats, of Republicans, and of independents saying they'll vote for her. The difference is how many say they'll vote for Harris and how many say they're gonna sit out the race or are undecided. Um, just a couple other things on this. Um, Sanchez has a slight lead among Latino likely voters. Uh, Harris has a wide lead among whites and among members of other racial and ethnic groups. And that includes Asian Americans and African Americans who we just don't have a big enough sample when we're talking likely voters to talk about them separately. So just the other, uh, other racial and ethnic groups, uh, Harris also has a, a wide lead among them. We also asked about satisfaction with US Senate candidates. About half of likely voters today say that they are satisfied with their choices. Um, and that's about what we've been seeing since May, actually before the primary. Uh, you might you know, not be surprised to see big differences among the parties here. Democrats much more likely um, than others to say that they're satisfied. Really, two and three Republicans saying they're not satisfied with just two Democrats on the ballot. So this is the California US Senate race. We also know each of the California House races are up for election uh, this year. And we asked just in general, do you prefer Democrats or Republicans to control Congress as a result of this election? And majority of California likely voters say they would prefer Democrats, 35% say Republicans, and it's overwhelming majorities within the parties saying they would prefer their own party to control Congress. Um, also a majority of independents say they'd prefer Democrats. So in one sense, this may just reflect the registration advantage that Democrats have to see overall a majority say they would prefer Democrats to control Congress. And we saw something similar when we asked in 2012, but going back to 2010, which you remember, you may remember, um, the Democrats controlled the House at that point, and that was the election where there was the kind of Tea Party wave election where Republicans retook the House. At that point, California likely voters were actually split between saying they wanted Democrats or Republicans. So it's not necessarily just uh, party registration here. We've seen this change uh, cycle to cycle. Looking at the um, state legislature, uh, if the Democrats pick up a few seats here, they have the opportunity to have a two-thirds supermajority in the state assembly and in the state senate. So we simply asked, if there was a supermajority for Democrats, would that be a good thing or a bad thing or make no difference for California? The plurality response, the most common response we got was that it would be a good thing. Um, that includes two thirds of Democrats saying it would be a good thing for the state. Two thirds of Republicans say it would be a bad thing. And it is the most common response among independents to say it would be a good thing. You can see here, we also asked the same thing uh, back before the 2014 election. At that point, uh, likely voters were more evenly divided in terms of whether it would be a good or bad thing. You can see the differences between 14 and 16 uh, on the parties here. And really, the biggest one is among independents, where today we're seeing independents are more likely to say it would be a good thing for Democrats to have a supermajority than they were to say that um, in 2014. I think it's interesting to kind of look at who is saying this would be a good thing. Among those who approve of the state legislature and among those who approve of the governor, six and 10 say it would be good for there to be a supermajority. Also among those who say that the state is heading in the right direction, six and 10 say it would be good for there to be a supermajority for Democrats. So now we can move on to the ballot propositions, which we asked four of the 17. Uh, we don't have a time in our survey or here to talk about 17 statewide propositions. So this will give you a little preview of the ones we did ask about. Um, both September and October, so we could see if there were any changes. We asked about Proposition 51, which is the state bond to fund school construction. Proposition 55, which would extend the tax on high incomes that was originally part of Prop 30 and is set to expire. Uh, Prop 56 is to increase the state cigarette tax by $2, and Prop 64 would legalize marijuana for recreational use among adults. You can see here that you know, the changes we saw between September and October are within our margins of error. Uh, the one where, when we look more closely at Prop 55, you'll see the gap between yes and no has widened a little bit. We'll take a closer look at that in a moment. So let me say for each of these, when we ask about the proposition, what we do is we read the full ballot title and label to the respondent in the survey, which I will spare you from doing today. This is awful to listen to. But we, we think it's the best way to kind of get a good sense of what, you because know, we're giving the same information to them that they're going to have when the ballot is in front of them. It's not a survey we're, or a summary we're making up about the initiative. It's really the information they're getting on the ballot. So when we ask the full title, uh, 
and label, um, we find that 46% say yes, they would vote. They would vote yes on Prop 51, the school bond. 41% say no. Of the four we asked about, this is the one that doesn't reach majority support. So here we have a solid majority of Democrats saying they'd vote yes, but as many Republicans saying they'd vote no, and independents are kind of split on this one. Looking across the state, majorities in Los Angeles and in the Orange County, San Diego region, they'd vote, they would vote yes, but majorities in the Central Valley and Inland Empire say they would vote no. On Prop 55, which again, this is the extension of the high income tax, or the income tax on, or on high in incomes. Um, here, 59% say they would vote yes, 31% say they would vote no. Majorities of Democrats and independents saying yes, majority of Republicans saying no. And I'll just tell you now, we'll see the same pattern among parties on the cigarette tax and on marijuana legalization, where Democrats and independents, majority say yes, and half or more Republicans say they would vote no. For the income tax, I think it's interesting to look at um, household income among the survey respondents. So uh, we actually find that majorities across income groups say that they would vote yes on Prop 55, so low, middle, and high incomes. But those making under $40,000 are most likely to say they would vote yes, with seven and 10 saying so. Next, on the cigarette tax increase. Here, 56% say they would vote yes, 38% say they would vote no. Um, it's 60% or higher in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles, and about half in other regions saying that they would vote yes on the cigarette tax increase. Here, about half of white likely voters and 80% of Latinos say they would vote yes on Prop 56. Uh, the other racial and ethnic groups kind of fall in between at 65% saying they'd vote yes. And the last proposition we asked about, again, marijuana legalization. Here, 55% of likely voters tell us they would vote yes. 38% say no. And on this one, I think it's interesting to look at, the again, the younger voters. Those 18 to 34, nearly 8 in 10 say they'd vote yes to legalize marijuana on Prop 64. And it's worth pointing out that from our surveys, we found about a third of young voters are registered as independents. About half are registered as Democrats. So you can see how they might be driving up these Democrat and independent numbers here, considering this is where most of them are registered. On this question, uh, majorities across regions they say they would vote yes for legalization of marijuana. Latinos are closely divided between yes and no. And majorities of, wh of whites and other groups say they would vote yes on Prop 64. So just one, a couple other things I want to talk about on the propositions before we move on. For each of these, we asked just how important to you is the outcome, kind of regardless of how you feel about the initiative, how important is the outcome of it? And on Prop 51, the school bond, that's the one where we found the least people saying it was very important to them. Um, a couple other interesting things on Prop 55, the income tax extension, those saying they would vote yes were more likely than those saying they would vote no to say the outcome was important. On marijuana legalization, it's the reverse, where those saying they would vote no uh, say the outcome, more likely to say the outcome is very important than those saying they would vote yes. So here where we have a majority telling us they would vote for the proposition, the no voters are more likely to see this as important. So it's something you might expect. I mean, could be related to how many people are actually going to you know, check the box on that one if they're motivated to do it. Um, but we'll see. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up on the propositions is for each of the for each of the issues, we have kind of a generic question about the issue in general that we've been asking for a while. So we asked those again just to compare attitudes toward the issue with the specific language of the proposition. So on 55, income tax extension, and on 64, marijuana legalization, attitudes among likely voters toward those issues in general are similar to what we find for the support for the propositions. We see some differences with the cigarette tax increase, where um, Likely voters are a little bit more likely to say in general they support a cigarette tax than they are to say they support this $2 increase. Though again, we're seeing a majority saying they would vote yes on the cigarette tax increase. Um, the bigger difference, and I think the more interesting one again, is on the school bond, where 59% of likely voters say in general they would vote yes on a school bond. But remember, we had 46% saying they would vote yes specifically on Prop 51. So there's some difference between just the idea of a school bond in general and the specific language of the Pro of Prop 51 where we're seeing a, a drop in support there. So the election is over. And now we can move on to the state and national issues. Um, first, just outlook for the state and for the nation. Here we have, you know, we ask, do you think that California is heading the right direction, the wrong direction? Same question about the United States. 
And you can see the comparison here. In general, um, Californians are more likely to be optimistic about the state or the direction of the state than the direction of the country. Uh, about half or more of adults and likely voters say that the state is heading in the right direction. About half or more of likely voters and adults say that the country is heading in the wrong direction. Um, and you can see here, Democrats and independents are somewhat more likely to say the state's heading in the right direction than they are to say that about the country. Looking back to 2012 again, attitudes toward the country's direction are about the same. Uh, the big difference, though, is among uh, attitudes about California. At that point, it was just four in 10 adults saying the state was heading in the right direction, again, compared to 54% today. So some improvement in uh, attitudes toward the direction of the state over the past four years. And you can kind of see that on this uh, time trend of approval ratings, which goes back to 2012. This is for the governor and legislature. Today, Governor Brown gets approval from 55% of adults and 56% of likely voters. Um, that's been pretty stable for the past two years or so, but you can see it was much lower back in October 2012 when we asked, at which point it was 42% among adults. <coughs> Similar story for the legislature, where we're 46% approved today, um, including 43% of likely voters. They've been steady for about the past year, but again, back in uh, 2012, approval of the legislature was much lower, 28% of adults and 21% uh, of likely voters. Looking across the state, um, in LA and in the Bay Area, six in 10 approve of the, uh, the governor, about half approve of the legislature. Um, in other regions, approval is lower, and the low point for the legislature is in the Central Valley, where 37% approve. Um, on parties, majorities of Democrats approve of the governor and approve of the legislature. Majorities of Republicans disapprove of the governor, disapprove of the legislature. About half of independents approve of the governor, and about one in th three approve of the legislature. As I mentioned, we asked what's the most important issue facing California. This is an open-ended question. And the most common response we got this time was it's jobs in the economy. So 28% of Californians tell us that. The next most common response was water and the drought, which was among 14%. Um, today, though, uh, in the Central Valley, it's still about even those who say the economy versus water and the drought. The economy and jobs has been the top issue in our survey since March of this year. Prior to that, it had been water in the drought for about a year before that. Looking at this chart, you can see kind of before previous elections, recent elections, um, similar before the October 2014 election, but a much more common response. Many more people saying that the economy was a problem or an issue for the state before the 2012 and 2010 elections. So you can see how that might relate to what we were looking at earlier, the lower approval ratings of the governor and legislature, um, the less optimistic attitudes about direction of the state back when people were more likely to say the economy was a problem. So now we turn to the federal government, uh, just looking at approval rating of elected officials there. President Obama is at 68% approval among all adults, 60% among likely voters. Um, his approval was nearly that high at his reelection in 2012, though the number we see today is his highest point in our survey since his first year in office. Um, there's kind of a, a low point in this chart where you can see in October 2014, and the increase in support for him since then has been among Democrats, independents, and Republicans. All of them have a more favorable opinion of him today than they did two years ago. For Congress, uh, approval is lower, 31% among adults, and 17% uh, for likely voters. This is similar to what is in, it was in 2012. And you know, just to summarize, it's fewer than half across regions, parties, racial and ethnic groups, um, age, education, and income groups saying they have a favorable opinion of uh, the way Congress is handling its job. Kind of related questions, we have a series on trust in the federal government. And this first one simply asks, how much of the time do you think you can trust the federal government in Washington to do what is right? Just about always, most of the time, or only some of the time. Here, 9% volunteer none of the time. Like those options don't work for them. They need to say, I never trust the government. So here, um, we have combined the kind of trusting or positive responses in dark blue and the kind of negative and not trusting in light blue. You see it's about 2 thirds of adults and likely voters saying they trust the federal government only some or none of the time. Um, Majorities across parties, though Republicans much more likely than Democrats to say so. I'll point out on this one that there are changes in this over time. When George W. Bush was president, Democrats were less trusting of the federal government. Republicans were more trusting of the federal government in our surveys. Um, one thing that I think is particularly striking on this one is when we look at the supporters of Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, Clinton supporters are about split between the trusting and not trusting answers. Uh, for Trump supporters, 
4% said trust always and most of the time. 96% say some or none of the time. And another question uh, that we'll look at on trust in the federal government, this is just about the amount of taxpayer money that's wasted. So in, on the bottom, in the dark blue, these are those saying a lot of money is wasted. Again, it's majorities of adults and likely voters. We found majorities have said this since we began asking it back in 1998. And today, Republicans are much more likely than independents or Democrats to say so, though you see that um, a majority of independents also says this. Looking at the candidates again, 43% of Clinton supporters say a lot of money is wasted. 90% of Trump supporters say a lot of money is wasted. The last issue we'll look at is um, favorability of the political parties. Um, today, about half of adults and likely voters approve of the Democratic Party in California. About one in four adults and likely voters approve of the Republican Party. And here you see, going back to 2012, I also marked um, this is late 2015, so again, before the primaries and caucuses started. So for Democrats, really about the same as where they were at the end of last year, and then back to 2012, kind of within our margin of error. Uh, for Republicans, they dropped a bit since last year and a bit more going back to 2012. Looking across age groups, majorities favor or view the Democratic Party favorably. Two-thirds across age groups view the Republican Party unfavorably. And I think where it gets interesting is kind of looking at the attitudes within parties. So among registered Democrats, Eight and 10 view their own party favorably, um, about as many did back in 2012. Among the Republicans, back in 2012, it was about three quarters said they viewed their party favorably, about a quarter said unfavorably. Today, it's half and half. Half say favorably, half say unfavorably among Republicans. One last question, and this has to do with a third major party. Um, the question is, do the Republican and Democratic parties do an adequate job representing the American people, or do they do such a poor job that a third major party is needed? Here, about six in 10 adults and likely voters say a third major party is needed, and uh, that's similar to what Gallup found nationwide uh, just last month. So Californian attitudes are similar to those nationwide. Um, this is a, a, up from about half saying so in October 2012, and kind of comparing these party responses between the cycles. The biggest increase is among Republicans, though there's an increase among independents also. And again, they're the most likely group to say a third major party is needed. Across regions of the state, it's majority saying a third major party is needed. Six in 10 say so in the Central Valley and in the Orange County, San Diego region. And across racial and ethnic groups, about half, uh, half or more say that, and it's seven in 10 whites uh, saying that a third major party is needed. So now I'm just going to kind of review some of our key findings from this, and then I'll take questions if you have them. Um, going back to the presidential race, Hillary Clinton has widened her lead. It's at 26 points now up from 16 in our last survey. Um, but when we look at the enthusiasm about people voting, uh, half say that they're enthousi more enthusiastic than usual, but Democrats are more likely to say that than Republicans or independents are. Looking at the US Senate race, Kamala Harris leads by 22 points. But again, half of Republicans are saying that they're undecided or that they won't vote in this race. Um, remember, though, that that number is kind of declining. Or we had uh, half of Republicans saying they wouldn't vote. Now it's about a third of them saying they wouldn't vote. Looking at the propositions, um, again, the Prop 51 school bond is the one that we asked about where we didn't see majority support. We saw that majorities have held on uh, the cigarette tax, on the high income tax extension, and on marijuana legalization. For Congress, most Likely voters prefer that Democrats would control it after this election. A plurality say that a two-thirds majority in the state legislature would be a good thing for the state. And then looking lastly at the favorability of the parties, it's held steady for Democrats, dropped a little bit for Republicans this year. And again, six in 10 say that a third major party is needed. So with that, um, if you have questions, people will come around with a microphone, just raise your hand, and then uh, we take them. In the graph of the approval uh, ratings for state elected officials, I noticed there was a seasonality with um, a bit of a spike up, and it seems to be in November. Can you, you have any uh, insight into that? Yeah, it's actually something that we tend to see in January, and that's, that's kind of the only insight I can give you. It is a pattern that we see. Um, so it could be, in some cases, it's post-election feeling. But other than that, I can't tell you. Other than that, it is something that, as you mentioned, we see recurring. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I've been coming to these briefings for quite some years, and I really enjoy them. So thank you very much for your work on these. Thank you. Um, my, my question is this. Over time, how has your polling compared with the actual results? Um, well, <laughs> so, so um, I think uh, uh, 538, if you're familiar, does a rating on pollsters across the country, in part because they look at our statewide finance to kind of estimate the presidential race. I think we got an A this year from them. So kind of considering you know, our methodology and past results and everything. So that's one indication. And I would add uh, that one of the things that we kind of take into consideration when we're doing our polling is the fact that we come out of the field you know, on Sunday, and the election isn't for another you know, 10, 12 days from there. So that kind of you know, puts us at a little bit of a disadvantage, sure. given that you know, there's a lot of time left. Also, you know, depending on the election, there may be a high number of don't knows. Um, we aren't necessarily you know, pushing those people to force them to make a decision into a yes or a no or one candidate versus the other. And so therefore, you always have a, you know, some proportion of people that we still have as don't know. And so, but traditionally, to answer your question, we've done um, OK, I think, better than OK. <laughs> um, but it's not necessarily something that we're looking to uh, you know, we're hoping to provide some analysis and some policy context, as well as other things that the survey can bring forth, but also at least provide a snapshot in time regarding candidate and proposition races. Yeah, you uh, knew a lot without looking down to your screen. Uh, I appreciate that. So, uh, why do you cut off the vertical axis at 80% instead of uh, 100? Because that may change the perception um, of the results. Um, we wouldn't do it, I mean, okay, so we wouldn't do it to alter the perception of the results. In some cases, we do it just to kind of make it, if it's a line chart, so you get a better sense of what the differences are. Hi, David, thank you. Hi. Um, can, do you have any sense of why California, or why likely voters are more inclined to support school bonds in general that have a problem with um, Proposition 51 in particular, or with maybe with school bonds this year. I guess I'm just asking you to speculate, like your opinion. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sonia. <laughs> um, it, it is interesting. Like I said, I think the difference between the general question on school bonds and, and Property 20 is interesting. And as I mentioned, it was about six in 10 likely voters saying they would vote in general for school bonds. Um, but when you step back and expand that to just all adults, is about three and four. So really, across California, it's, it's a widely popular idea. But then when you kind of narrow down to the group of likely voters, so who are the people who actually we expect to show up and vote? And then again, the specifics on the initiative. Really, all I can speculate on that is that, you know, it's really just the difference in the question, is that when we're reading the, the ballot summary or the, the label, it has the details on how much it costs and what the payments are. So I do think it really is just a matter of once you give people the full details on that. Because again, it is strong support on the generic question. So I wouldn't say it's something peculiar about this year. I think it's more about the language of the initiative. I understand you're just doing polling and you're listening to what people have to say. But this seems to be among the most contentious um, elections we've ever seen. In your polling, what you've seen and listened to, is there any hope that that's gonna, that it's opened our eyes and maybe we can grow from this? Or? Boy, you're asking a lot. <laughs> um, so when I mentioned that people say that the election's a problem when I can open with the, that joke, um, that's part of a group of, it's about 5% saying that just government in general is a problem, you know, which is not insubstantial. If you think about 14% said it's water in the drought, 5% are saying government and political parties and politicians. So you're right. And when you look at kind of the um, even satisfaction with the candidates, enthusiasm about voting, things that are just lower than they were four years ago. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe somewhere in the report is, is buried some kind of like uh, optimism about it, but, but I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your survey. Um, for this current survey and maybe some of your past ones, are you spotting any emerging trends, uh, particularly among young people, whether voting or not voting? Are you picking up on trends? Well, one thing, I think it's related to um, 
as I mentioned, about a third of young voters are registered as independents. And we've seen a, a trend of increasing independent registration in California. So I think that's part of it. And um, not that I have the exact answer of why they're registering that way, but I think that's a, kind of a big part of just what's happening in California politics. And then, of course, the way that young people kind of view issues. Um, they're more likely to say they're liberal or, more or, less, or less likely to say they're conservative. So, you know, as they um, kind of grow as a group and if they do vote, you know, I think it will ultimately, you know, kind of change the trajectory of election outcomes. You know, if they continue, if they vote, you know, and they continue to hold those views. <laughs> so your poll was in the field for a number of days, and I understand that individual days, uh, there's a lot of noise in that data, but was there any movement between when you first started polling the questions and the last day that you may, might made you think that something is moving, especially among the initiatives? Um, you know, one thing we did look at was because the, uh, the presidential debate was right in the middle of that, so we kind of wanted to know, and that was something that was one question we did look at and didn't see a difference, you know, before and after. Um, and you're right, it is kind of like we, we survey over ten days, so we can kind of get enough interviews, so it's hard to look day by day. Um, it may be interesting though to kind of look further to see if any other issues change, but that I don't know. I'm wondering if you have any any data on Proposition 61. I do not. No, we only asked about the four. Any other questions? Okay, thank you all for being here today. Appreciate it.